So this is another video in the series for Math 1224 for UTSA. Uh, today we're going to take a little bit of a time travel trip to 2.8, Exponential Growth and Decay. Um, so we're doing things a little bit out of out of order. In Chapter 2, we skipped a few sections, some of which we're just not going to do. Uh, this one we're just doing out of order. Um, uh, for reasons that make sense, if you think about the pacing of the course, we didn't do 2.7 and 2.9, so the context that this one was present in, we're not doing, so we didn't need to cover it until this point, because in section 4.4, .4, where we talk about the logistic equation, having this context would be more useful by then. So the next video after this will be clearer if we talk about this now. So exponential growth and decay. So you've certainly seen this in Cal 1, in pre-Cal, you've seen exponential functions uh, for like um, population growth or um, compound interest and then uh, decay functions for like, um, I don't know, uh, well, so for example, um, uh, radioactive uh, decay, radioactive isotopes, and then also maybe something like um, a snowball melting and the, 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 the rate at which the snowball melts changes over time or an ice cube that changes over time. So this is an um, uh, example of a differential equation, dy dx equals y. So the rate of change in the function is equal to the y coordinate on the graph or the, otherwise the output of the function. Um, what you will see later in, if you're doing engineering or physics or chemistry, then probably at some point you'll see something that's um, often called the standard guess. Um, because in those science courses, you're not necessarily always deeply interested in the underlying mathematics. You're interested in solving the problem. Um, so we're not going to do that here, but I will point out again towards the end. So there is a thing we could do to start, but let's not do it that way. Let's just take a, a forward-looking approach. So much like in 4.3 separation of variables, I need to get all my um, x's on one side and all my y's on the other side. And ultimately, it doesn't matter if this is on the left or on the right. But of course, I don't want to have like 1 over dx on the left and then y over dy on the right. That wouldn't really help me. So instead, I'm going to uh, think of this derivative dy dx as being the ratio of the differentials. So I can multiply dx on both sides. So I get uh, dy equals uh, y dx. And of course, this y is not where it should be. So I'm going to divide y on both sides. So I'll have a uh, 1 over y dy equals 1 dx. Okay, so now I can integrate on both sides, right? So on the left, I'll have ln of the absolute value of x. Oh, also, I forgot something. This really ought to be an initial value problem. It, it, it doesn't have to be, but I, I do ultimately want it to be. So we'll say 0, 1 is the initial value. Okay, so this equals uh, x plus c. And if I want, then at this point, I can find out what c is. Um, no. I made a silly mistake here. See if you can spot the mistake. Anyway, that should be a uh, y, not x, right? Okay. So um, I can plug in my initial value and say, oh, well, that means that um, ln of 1, which this is why I uh, noticed, because ln of 0 doesn't make any sense, equals 0 plus c. So 0 equals c, right? ln of 1 is 0. So my equation is ln of y, absolute value of y really equals uh, x, right? Because c is zero. I can move the ln to the other side. So absolute value of y equals e to the x. And then um, I can say, oh, well, that means, you know, I put out pluses or minuses. Well, I know that my initial value has a positive y coordinate. So y can't be negative in this case. So y equals uh, just e to the x, right? That's, that's the solution. This is the specific solution. What if we did something a little bit different? And I'm going to do this, I'll put that over here, uh, and I don't need to shrink it. Okay, what if we do something a little bit different? What if I say that the rate of change is not equal to y, it's proportional to y. So let's say a dy dx equals k times y, some constant times y. Now I can do basically all the same stuff, but then k will kind of float around and, and end up somewhere. So... Uh, I'll move, uh, I'll divide by ky on both, well, I'll divide by y on both sides. The k can see where it is, and I'll multiply dx on both sides. So 1 over y dy equals k dx. I can integrate on both sides and hopefully not repeat that same error that I made. So I'll get ln of the absolute value of y. Yeah, I almost wrote x again. 
equals, oh, and also initial value. Let's say that um, 0, 1 is the same initial value, let's suppose. Okay, so then this will be, uh, well, kx plus c. And I can plug in my initial value and say, okay, well, that means that ln of 1 equals uh, 0 plus c, right? k times 0 is 0, so 0 equals c again in this case. Uh, of course, if the initial value is slightly different, then, then c would be a different number. Okay, so this will be uh, ln of the absolute value of y equals kx, okay? So then the, um, the uh, then I can make the same reasoning where I, I move the um, ln over and then drop the absolute value bars for the same reason because the initial value is positive. The y coordinate of the initial value is positive. So absolute value of y equals e to the kx power. So then y equals e to the kx. So this is the model that you'll use whenever you want to model something where, or the equation you would use whenever you want to model something where the rate of change is proportional, not equal to, but proportional to the y value. Okay. So where would this show up? Well, uh, compound interest is one example. And I guess since I was saved on space a little bit, I can give myself some more room for down here. So compound interest, if you deposit money in a uh, you know, interest-bearing account, you know, you, typical sa consumer savings accounts really don't get very much, something like 0.1%. It used to be, you might end, you might earn 2, 3, 4% interest on, on a deposit, but that's kind of um, not common anymore. What you can do now is you can buy like a certificate of deposit that earns a certain amount each year. You can invest in a 401k or an IRA. Some things are more market tied, some things are, um, some things are, are less market tied, but for example, an IRA would be market tied. And you might have be able to predict, oh, the average return year to year would be this amount. So in 30 years, I can predict this is what I'll probably have, right? So the formula for that, for compound interest, is that the amount in the account is equal to the principal times one plus the rate divided by the number of compounding periods per year raised to the, uh, num the power of the number of compounding periods per year times the number of years. So in other words, if you're going to compound quarterly four times a year, then your interest rate, you only apply one fourth of it at a time, right? But your exponent will be four times whatever the number of years because you're each year you, you do it four times, right? So, you know, the beginning of every quarter, the interest is calculated, it's um, capitalized into the principal, and now here's your new um, current amount for that three months until it changes again three months later. So if you, and, and in, in pre-cal or, or in algebra class, I would spend a lot of time doing numerical examples, but you've you've almost certainly seen this before. So we just need a summary. So I'll, I'll cut to the chase a little bit. If you um, consider what happens with a with a, a given amount of principal, like a thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars, or just you know pick a simple number, and you pick an interest rate like I don't know five percent, four percent, two percent, something like that, and then you just go forward and see well what what am I going to get as a result? Say over ten years, right? So if you say okay ten thousand dollars. Uh, at 2% interest for four years compounded quarterly, what do I get, right? And then you figure out that's the, the amount you would have at the end of the 10 years. So for example, if you buy a 10-year certificate, certificate of deposit, which those, I believe they typically have interest rates of like 1.7, roughly, um, their, their estimated return. So we'll just say 2% to make things easier. Well, if you calculate for um, compounding, say, say annually, you'll get whatever the amount is. If you recalculate saying, well, no, I'm going to compound quarterly, well, then you would get a little bit more return that way your your annual percent yield would be a little bit better than two percent because you're every time you every 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 quarter you're earning interest on the interest that you got from earlier in the year so second quarter interest is more than first quarter interest because that first quarter interest was capitalized and then second quarter when you go to calculate the interest you you get interest on on that interest that you had already earned and similar from quarter to quarter year to year um, the, the, you get a little bit more benefit in the interest by doing it every quarter. You, you apply one, one fourth of the interest rate four times as often, basically. So what if you compounded monthly or weekly or daily, or you had a room full of computers calculating teeny tiny slices of your interest rate a billion times a second, right? Like you literally can do that, right? You have computers do that for you. 
Um, what would that look like? Like, obviously, you wouldn't want to spend the money and resources to have a computer do that when probably there's some sort of mathematical thing we can do, right? So if you let n go to infinity, if you let the number of compounding um, um, periods per year go to infinity, right, then what you get is this goes to p times e to the rt power, okay? So you'll notice, hey, that kind of looks like a lot like this. And what I was saying up here with this, with this equation, this models, and in particular, this differential equation, this models what happens um, when you have something where the growth rate is proportional to the present amount. Well, that's how compound interest works, right? When you go to calculate the interest, say the 2% on $10,000, well, that's gonna be what? Is that $200? Is that 200? Yeah, it's $200, right? Um, for the first quarter, the first, you know, the, the, the when, well, after, I'm sorry, at the end of the first quarter, I suppose, it would be $200. And now in the account is $10,200. And so when you go to calculate again, well, it's not $200 for the next period. It's, well, it's 2% of whatever $10,200 would be. So that'd be like $204 or something like that. So now you have $10,404 in the account. And then so when you go to do the next compounding, it's not $204. It's like, it's like $200. Uh, let me guess, like, uh, well, not, not guessing, but let me ballpark. It's something like $208 and, and 15 cents or something like that, right? It's, it's, it's um, the, the, the amount of interest that you earn each time goes up, right? Which I'm kind of repeating myself, but I'm just trying to emphasize that this is what this equation describes as literally what compound interest does. The difference is with compound interest, you, it's on an organized schedule, right? That you, you compound every, year or every quarter or every month or whatever it is. So this does not directly describe, well, sorry, this directly describes a, a, a planned, discrete um, compounding schedule. This describes, it just, is, it just is kind of always happening. And that's more useful when you have situations like um, populations, like uh, say populations of people, animals, um, bacteria, stuff like that. This also will relate to things like virus spread. Um, it's kind of always continuously happening. This is why it's called continuous compounding. Um, so uh, basically, when you when you learn about this in an algebra class or pre-calculus class, you're just given here's the formula. Of course, in a pre-cal class, you don't talk about solving a differential equation. That would be meaningless at that point because you have no idea what derivatives are and antiderivatives. Uh, but now we, we do, and so we don't have to just look at the formula and plug numbers in. We can say, well, what other kinds of differential equations that describe different kinds of population growth, for example? What what are the different kinds? So in the previous video, we had two examples with like um, a retail store having uh, their sales growing, uh, their revenue or their sales or whatever it was that I, I had said in the previous video, um, like at 5% annually. And the first model was that there was going to be uninhibited exponential growth, which is not realistic because that's just not how economies work, right? You can't have, I think I said a hardware store, um, you know, if you wait long enough, it now, you know, its sales are a billion dollars every month. Like it's just, that doesn't make any sense for a single hardware store, right? And, and then since it's, it's uninhibited growth forever, oh, well, the, um, the sales would exceed the number of, I don't know, the number of uh, people on the planet. Like you would get over 7 billion a month and then it would get up to, it would exceed uh, the number of, uh, I don't know, planets in the galaxy or stars in the galaxy or whatever it is. Like we get huge, ridiculous numbers that make no sense because of the assumption of uninhibited growth forever. So then we looked at a model where there was, um, you, you would gain 5% of your potential. Like if you're starting out at say $20,000 in sales and the maximum you could ever achieve would be a million, well, then you're going to get, you're going to, per, per, I guess it was year, I, I suppose, you're, you're going to increase your sales by 5% of the remaining potential. And that means, well, eventually you kind of max out, like you've reached your potential and that's it, right? That had the un, unrealistic property that um, if your sales start out at zero, then you would suddenly gain 5% of that potential overnight. Like that doesn't make any sense either. So we'll look at different models. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about, um, about um, some, some applications of, of this kind of formula. Okay, so let's say if a colony of bacteria currently has 1,000 members, 
then grows at a rate of 15% per minute. How long will it take to get to 2,000 members? How about 10,000? Now, of course, you've probably seen a problem like this in algebra or pre-calculus where you just use the formula. And so you probably could already do this, but I want to go through the calculus portion of it because doing this several times, which might maybe, you know, might get a little tedious because didn't we just, didn't we kind of just do this? Well, yes, but let's go through it again. And the reason is, as we start getting other models that are more complicated, being familiar with the process will make it a lot easier rather than, well, let's just use the formulas that are already in the book somewhere. Um, and then we'll only do it the calculus way when we don't have a formula to refer to. Well, then we're doing it. We're ultimately making it harder for ourselves if we we're, we're not getting practice when we could basically. So what is, what is this problem really telling me? Well, it's saying that, um, 15% is the growth rate. So in this case, K is 0.15, 15%. The initial value is 1000. So this corresponds to having like a 0 comma 1000. Okay. And, and again, this corresponds like K equals 0 0.15. Okay. So that means my differential equation, and I could use P for population or B for bacteria. It doesn't really matter. I'll just use Y is, a, is the output variable. So dy dt, and I use t for time, right? This equals 0 0.15 times y. The growth rate is 15% of the present population, right? And so this will work out basically just like this. But it didn't take us that long, so it's not too painful. But but the initial value is not 1, so that part is a little uncertain. If I just use this formula, I'm not going to get... I, I, I can't because then where does the 1,000 go, right? So I do kind of need to redo this again anyway because uh, because it worked out really simply in the, in the first place. So um, I'll divide y on both sides. So 1 over y, dy, and I'll multiply dt on both sides. So 0 0.15 dt. We'll integrate on both sides. On the left, we'll get ln the absolute value of y. Now on the right, we will get 0.15t plus c. Okay. Now I can go ahead and use my initial value, 0, 1000. So this will be ln of the absolute value of 1000, which I guess I don't need the absolute value anymore, equals uh, 0 0.15 times 0, which I guess is just 0, plus c. Oh, I am running out of space. plus uh, C, okay? So C equals ln of 1,000. And if I want, I could rewrite this as uh, 1,000 equals E to the C. I, I may want to do that. Okay, so over here, I can uh, move the ln to the other side. Y, uh, absolute value of Y equals E to the 0 0.15t plus c. And and it's possible either now or earlier, someone thought, wait, you you just said you're going to move the L into the other side, but now it's an e. Why is that? Well, this is because uh, e is the uh, the number that is the base of the natural logarithm. So when you see ln, this is really log with like a little um, subscript e, right? Like you have log base 2 or log base 5 or whatever log you want. So ln is the shortcut for log base e. So e was there the whole time. And when I move the e to the other side, it becomes an exponential base rather than a logarithmic base. Okay. Um, and so I can drop the absolute value bars because, um, well, let's do, let's do it this way. Let's not drop it just yet. Let's do this. So e to the 0 0.15 t power times e to the c, because I have a sum in the exponent. And e to the c is 1,000, which I can also uh, write this in front if I want. So 1,000 e to the 0 0.15 t power. And I'm going to drop the bars here because if I put if I put a minus on the left, well, then y would be negative 1,000 as an initial value. And I don't want that. I want I want this to be counted as a positive value. So there is uh, the, mo the, the an equation that models um, the, the information given in the problem. What was the original question? How long will it take to get to 2,000 members? OK, cool. So. All I gotta do is plug 2,000 in for y, the population variable, and then solve the equation, the resulting equation. So divide by 1,000 on both sides, 2 equals. And notice that um, 
the problem asks us how long will it take to get to 2,000, which is the which is twice as much as 1,000. So what we're going to be finding is also also sometimes called the doubling time. So e to the 0 0.15 g power, move the e to the other side, ln, which I guess I could have really done it earlier, but that's okay. ln of 2 equals 0 0.15 t, and then divide by 0.15 t. So 100 ln of 2 over 15 equals t. So t is approximately, and I guess I'm almost out of room, so I'll put it down here, t. We don't always need a decimal approximation, but in an application problem like this, sometimes we do want one. So 100 times ln of 2 divided by 15. So I get 4.621. 4.621. And this was in minutes. So four and a half minutes, roughly, to get to 2,000. So this is the doubling time. So if you ask, well, what about 4,000? Well, wait another 4.621 uh, yeah, minutes. What about to 8,000? Well, wait another 4. Point, it's how long it takes to double. So just wait another 4.6 minutes. So if you wanted, you know, if you wanted to estimate 10,000, say, well, it's a little bit longer than, than triple this amount, right? Because you would go from 1,000 to 2,000, that'd be doubling once, then, then to 4,000 doubles again, then to 8,000 doubles again. If you wait another 4.6 minutes, you'll get to 16,000. So we don't want to wait that long. So if you triple this number, it's a little bit longer, right? So the doubling time is a useful way to estimate these values relatively quickly. Like if I triple this, what do I get? I get about 13.86 uh, minutes, so about 14 minutes-ish. But of course, we don't have to do that. I can say, well, what if I just set the function up? What if I just set the function equal to 10,000 and solve the equation and see what I get? Okay, so if I divide, divide by 1,000 on both sides. Move the e over to the other side. So ln 10. 0.15t divided by 0 0.5, 0 0.15 on both sides, so 100. In fact, I probably could reduce this. Why am I doing 100? So this would be 20 ln 10 over 3. So t is approximately 20 times ln 10 divided by 3. I get 15.351. Uh, So my, my estimate of 14 minutes, it's a little short, but you know, that, that's okay. It was, a, it was a ballpark estimate anyway. Okay, so let's look at another example of this. This one's a little bit different. The remain, I'm sorry, the half-life of polonium-210, this is a radio, radioactive isotope, is 138.376 days. How much will remain in a two gram sample after 15 days? Okay, so the half-life means how long does it take to drop to half of its value? Okay, so, I think for this one, we'll go ahead and cut to the chase with the formula. We've done this process basically three times now. So I think that's enough. Well, I'll just say, okay, we know the formula is going to be y equals some number a times e to the rt power, some, some rate, right? And I could use k, in fact. Yeah, let's, let's do k instead of r. It, it doesn't really matter, but I could say k, kt, because that's what we we're using earlier uh, R is for interest rate, of course. The letter doesn't matter. Uh, this is also what we'll call the standard guess uh, for the solution to an initial value problem. I don't think um, the textbook, the open stacks book refers to this and the homework won't, but this, this is what I learned when I first learned differential equations um, it, it, because I, I, I double majored math and physics. So I actually learned differential equations in physics because we covered it earlier than I learned it in, in math class. So we were cutting corners a lot because we're just trying to calculate the thing. We don't you know, necessarily care about the broader method. What is the overarching method of solving differential equations? We just want to solve this problem in physics class. So we call that the standard guess. If you're solving a differential equation, uh, when we're doing harmonic analysis, um, like uh, os oscillations, things going back and forth, right? Like a pendulum, right? And then this is your guess. It's something like this. Anyway, um, if I say, oh, well, that means I want to ask, um, 
if if I plug in my two and say, well, that's the initial value is two, e to the kt power, and I don't know what k is, what I can do is say, well, um, the half-life is 138.376 days. So I could say, well, why? This is sort of like my my um, initial value is coming from the from the following. The half-life is 138 days. So that tells me that um, 138.376 comma 1 is my initial value, basically. So this equals 2 times e to the k times 138.376 power, okay? So I can divide by two on both sides. So one half equals e to the, uh, I'm gonna change the order in this exponent here. It's not important that I do that, but I typically like, I typically like to have numbers at the end of an expression, or sorry, uh, letters rather at the end. I can move the e over. So this gives me ln of one half equals uh, 138.376k, and then divide by 138.376 on both sides. So ln of 1 half, which you may notice could be rewritten as negative ln of 2. So there is k. So k is approximately, let's throw this in the calculator, so ln of 1 half divided by 138.376. And I get negative point zero zero five zero zero nine zero zero five zero zero nine, and we could just round to three places. This this is two zeros here, but I'll, I'll keep it like that. So um, our function then is y equals uh, two e to the negative zero point zero zero five zero zero nine t power. So this function will model the decay of polonium 210 into lead. Okay. And then the question was, how much will remain in a two gram sample after 15 days? Well, I just got to plug in 15 and see what I get. So if equals 15, y equals two times e to the negative 0 0.005009 times 15 power. So what is that? So two times e and if I wanted, I probably could um, try to use this and plug this in here instead, but I'll just use the rounded value. That's going to be pretty close because we kept enough decimal places. Or in fact, I can have the calculator take the answer from the previous line. I'll be even more accurate. Okay, so I get 1.855. And this is grams left over in the sample. Okay, so what's next? Now, I like this one. Um, the, the name for this is uh, Newton's Law of Cooling, which I guess we'll put here. Okay. Newton's Law of Cooling. Basically, this is a, just it's a way to describe how things um, uh, change temperature in environment. Um, and, and interestingly, it works for heating as well. So I don't know why it's called Newton's law of cooling if it applies just as well to heating. Um, anyway, so let's say, um, a crime scene investigator needs to estimate how much time has passed between a person dying and their body being found. A 52 degree Fahrenheit body is found in a 40 degree walking cooler. Based on clothing, the body should cool with K equals 0.15. How long ago did the death occur? So there is a formula for this, of course, but we're going to basically set up and then solve the differential equation. So let's say um, I'll use lowercase t for time, and I'll use f for Fahrenheit, okay? So let's say uh, df dt equals, well, the body cools with this, this rate, k equals 0 0.15. What this means is, that the difference between the body's temperature and the ambient temperature in the room or the walking cooler should decay over time. It should go to get to zero eventually. If you, just, if, you if no one opens that that walking cooler for like a month or whatever, then everything in there will be the exact same 40 degree temperature, assuming that the, the thermometer is accurate and all that stuff. So this is going to equal 0 0.15 times 
the um, 40 degrees minus the person's uh, body temperature, the you know, deceased person's body temperature. This is also often written slightly differently. This is often written like this, uh, negative 0 0.15 times F minus 40, which is the same thing, right? There's no difference there. Um, but this is what the book does. So we'll, we'll, we'll do it this way. I, I think to me, this makes more sense. Like, why do I have this extra minus sign that I don't need to have? But it doesn't really matter. So now we need to solve this differential equation. This is not the same as the previous one because of this minus 40. This is not the same thing, okay? Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to um, divide F minus 40 on both sides and then multiply DT on both sides. So one over F minus 40. And I suspect that this step here is the reason um, for having F minus 40 versus 40 minus F just because it makes the substitution 2% easier. Uh, so negative 0 0.15 uh, dt. Okay, so now when I integrate on the left, I have to do a substitution. I can either say, you know, u equals f minus 40, or I just sort of implicitly know, oh, well, we have to use the uh, substitution, you know, use the chain rule backwards for the antiderivative and say, oh, well, this is going to this is going to be ln of the absolute value of f minus 40, right? ln, the absolute value of f minus 40, okay? So this will be a negative 0.15t plus c. So looking at this, and we'll consider our initial value in a moment, the, the person's body is cooling, right? So f minus 40 can never be negative because if, if f minus 40 were negative, that would mean that the body is cooler than the room, but that's not gonna happen right? Um, the body is warmer, and then it cools over time. So we could just toss out the absolute value bars right away. So ln of f minus 40 equals negative 0 0.15 t plus c. Okay, so now we can think about our initial value, right? Well, initial value, well, the, um, Present value is 52 degrees. The initial value, I guess we'll assume, uh, it doesn't say it in here, but of course you probably know that in Fahrenheit, um, the average body temperature for a person is 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it actually varies a lot, but we'll go with that. I, you know what, let's say this person was unusually warm, mm, but the CSI person wouldn't know that. Okay, we'll just go with the average, right? The CSI person is not gonna know their medical history and, oh, um, I don't know. Did they, did they just go for a run before they were, you know, you know, sapped in the head in the cooler. And so their, their temperature was higher, but, you know, they're not going to know those things. So we'll go with the average, 98.6. So uh, ln of 98.6 minus 40 equals negative 0 0.15 times 0 plus C. So C is going to equal ln of 58.6 which is approximately, well, you know what? Maybe we're not gonna need this because um, I'm probably just gonna do the following. Uh, um, e to the C equals 58.6 most likely. But you know what, just in case, just in case, let's do this. Ln of 58.6, I get 4.0707. Typically I'll keep three decimal places for an answer, but, but when I'm working out a problem, I'll, I'll typically keep a little bit, a few more decimal places. So if I use this rounded number, I'm still remaining fairly accurate in the result. Okay, so that means that I can take uh, this guy. Are we almost out of room? Yeah, we're almost out of room. There's another pro similar problem down here. Let's do the following. Um, so we do need a bit more room. Yeah, that's, that's fine. Let's just do this. So I'm gonna uh, move E. Well, I'll, I'll first copy it and then we'll start moving stuff around. So ln of F minus 40 equals negative, equals negative 0 0.15 T plus C. Okay, so I'll move uh, E to the other side. So F minus 40 okay, equals um, e 
to the negative 0 0.15 k plus c power, and then I will use the fact that I have a sum and an exponent, e to the negative 1.5 t power times uh, e to the c. And so f minus 40 equals that. I'll add 40 to both sides. So f equals 40 plus e to the negative 0 0.15 t times 58.6 degrees. Okay. So, uh, I can rewrite this if I want as f as a function of t equals, I'll, I'll change the order around 58.6e to the negative 0 0.15t power plus 40. Okay. So, then the question is, well, if they were found at 52 degrees, how long ago did that happen? So, let's say 52 degrees is what they're found at. So, this equals 58 0.6e to the negative 0 0.15 t power plus 40. Subtract 40 on both sides, so 12 equals 58.6e to the negative 0 0.15 t power. Divide by 58.6 on both sides. Uh, move the e to the other side. ln of 12 over 58.6 equals negative 0.15t, and then divide by negative 0.15 on both sides. Okay, so that's t. So t is approximately, although this is an exact value, right? I, I kind of need to know, well, yeah, but how much is that? I don't that's not a recognizable number I can use. And I get 10.57. Two. This is in hours. So there you go. The, the, the person found in the walking cooler died 10, about 10.6 hours ago. So that's what, like 10 hours and 35 minutes, something like that. What's 0.57? Two times sixty, yeah, ten hours thirty four and a half minutes, something like that. Ten hours thirty four minutes, ten hours thirty five minutes, something like that. Anyway, um, something to point out is you know a lot of this is all very similar um to the previous ones, but the antiderivative here on the left was a little bit different. We had to think about a substitution, and then also looking at the resulting function, this says that the the temperature is forty plus. This decaying amount, 58.6 is the amount, is, you know, the, the degrees Fahrenheit above the room temperature that the person, you know, normally would be. And then once deceased, that decays over time, right? And the decay rate depends on their clothing and stuff like that. Um, well, a number of different factors. Is the air moving or is it still? A number of different factors influence that. Anyway, let's go look at um, the next example. So this one's very similar, but 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 different. So CSI needs to estimate how much time has passed between a person dying and their body being found. Same thing. I literally copy and pasted that. A 50-degree body is found in a 40-degree walking cooler. 30 minutes later, the body measures 40 degrees. How long did the body remain unfound? And that um, is a, a mistake. It should not be 40, because that would be like, oh, they've been there a month. 48. 48 degrees. Fahrenheit, of course. Okay, so... We um we don't know anything necessarily about their their the, basically the previous problem gave us the k value based on clothing and the environment um you know it's, it's it's like a walking cooler so it's not like there's a wind going or something right if you were outside when it's forty degrees and there's no wind it's you know cold but it's fine but if there's a wind it feels way colder right um but we don't have that but we do know that, well, we took a temperature is 50 degrees, and then 30 minutes later, it's 48 degrees. So they've lost two degrees in um, 30 minutes. So that that kind of gives us a, this is a clue as to the, the decay rate, right? Um, I will comment that I have not worked out this problem before. I, I honestly do not know how to solve it already. I mean, I have an idea, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. And I think that's okay. Um, that you see, okay, what's the process? If I'm doing something that I don't already know how to do, which is, you know, what you do as a student, 
Um, how does that go? So um, I'm going to cut to the chase a little bit, and I'm going to do the following. I'm going to say, okay, uh, df dt. Okay, this is going to equal k some multiplier times the um, what did I say it was earlier? Yeah, forty minus. Okay, the the ambient temperature minus the person's body temperature in Fahrenheit. Okay, that's basically what we had. And we're going to rewrite this the following way to make the um, integral easier. Well, I said cut to the chase. I guess we'll go ahead and work through it. But it's it's pretty predictable. You could probably, based on what I said earlier about the 58.6 being the difference of the person's body temperature normally and the ambient temperature, you can probably work out how this is going to go. Anyway, I'll divide by F over A on both sides. So 1 over F minus A. I might have said f over a, I meant f minus a, divided by f minus a on both sides. df, oh, and I've made a mistake here. Um, I put uppercase here and lowercase here. That is not correct. Upper and lowercase letters are not the same. Math is case sensitive. So I need to be uh, using only lowercase consistently. I was doing uppercase because of Fahrenheit, probably. Okay, uh, minus k dt. Right, okay, so... And I'll integrate, and we get ln of the absolute value of f minus a, oops, equals negative kt plus c, okay? So um, this is going to be, we can drop the absolute, absolute value bars, of course, f minus a equals um, e to the negative kt plus c power, so f uh equals a a plus e to the c times e to the negative k t power. So as we saw before, this this here, this is basically the difference between the ambient temperature and the person's um, initial temperature, right? So f f equals a plus the um, initial temperature minus the ambient temperature times e the negative k t power so this is newton's law of cooling the temperature as a function of time so i noticed while editing that i did gloss over something a little bit when i was saying oh yeah this is oh of course this is just um e to the c is i minus a let's let's make sure that's clear so my initial value will be zero comma whatever the initial amount is you know, for, for temperature for person 98.6 degrees. So I'll say I minus A equals E to the negative K times zero plus C power. So I minus A equals E to the C. So yeah, that's true. Maybe not so obvious. So I'm going to interject that here. Is the ambient temperature plus the difference between the um, initial temperature and ambient temperature times e to the negative kt power, and k is some constant, depends on the situation. Uh, the environment, what what is it just an object? Like, is it a piece of metal, or is it a person? You know, what, what is it, right? So we can use this formula. Say, okay, f, the function of time, equals the ambient temperature, which is 40, right? Plus the initial minus the ambient, which would be 58.6. times e to the negative kt power. And this time it's k that we don't know. The problem didn't provide k, but it's kind of like we have two initial conditions. Um, the the body's found at 40, I'm sorry, 50 degrees. And then 30 minutes later, uh, the temperature is taken to be 48 degrees. If I basically say, okay, let's say that the time that they were found is a, and I don't know how much that is. So if I knew how, if I knew the time from death was six hours or whatever, well, then I'd be done. So I don't. Let's say it's A. It's, I, I don't know what it is. So that means if I plug in A, I'm going to get 50 for the resulting temperature. Okay. If I plug in A plus 0.5, well, then I'll get 48 degrees because that's 
the um, that's the new temperature reading after 30 minutes. Oh, I have an equation with two variables. Maybe I can solve and get, or two equations rather with two variables. Maybe I can solve this pair of equations, right? So on, on each equation, I'll, I'll sort of work them concurrently. I will subtract 40 on both sides, and then I'll also divide by 58.6 on both sides. So I will have 10 over 58.6 equals E the negative k a power, and then I'll have a uh, 8 over 58.6 equals e to the negative k times a plus 0 0.5 power. Okay, uh, I will um, move the e to the other side on both of these, so ln of 10 over 58.6 equals negative k a, and then ln uh, 8 over 58.6 equals negative k times a plus 0 0.5. Okay. So if I were to, um, I don't know, divide these two equations, right? Like take the top, take um this divided by this on the left and then this divided by this on the right. Right? I can divide equations like that. So... And I'm going to run out of room, aren't I? Yeah, pretty soon. That's okay. We'll, we'll come over here. So ln of 10 over 58.6 equals negative ka. Um, on the left and right, I'm going to have ln on the left uh, of 10, 8 over 58.6. And on the right, negative, negative k times a plus 0 0.5. So now, clean this up a little bit. It's kind of messy. There, it looks a little bit better. Okay. So now I can cancel these Ks out. I don't actually need to find K, do I? If I just care what A is, when was, when was the body found? I mean, I could still find K afterward if I wanted to. I just don't necessarily need to. So then I will have um, that uh, Ellen... And this is going to look kind of messy. We have a lot of numbers here, but it'll it'll work out. Ln of 10 over. And in fact, you know what? Let's do this. Um, in order to make things a little bit cleaner for me, I'm just going to call this whole thing uh, V. So I have V equals A over A plus 0.5. And I'll, I'll put the V back in later. Okay, that, that big messy expression. I just don't want to write that six or seven times. So I'll multiply A plus 0.5 on both sides. And then I will distribute on the left. So VA plus V times 0 0.5 equals A. So then I'll subtract uh, VA on both sides. So V times, in fact, let's do it this way, 0 0.5 V equals A minus VA. So 0 0.5 V equals A times 1 minus V. So then I can divide by 1 minus v on both sides. So 0 0.5 v equals 1 minus v over a. So a, I plug v back in now. This is going to be kind of a mess. Big fraction with fractions in it. So this is going to be 0 0.5 times, well, ln of 10 over 58.6 over ln of 8 over 58.6 over 1 minus that same thing. And I don't know about you, but um, I'm uh, just going to do a little sneaky duplicate there. There we go. Okay. Well, that's nice and messy. Um, if I want to simplify that, I can multiply by, essentially, I can multiply by um, ln of 8 over 58.6 on top and bottom. I end up with the following. Uh, 0 0.5 ln 
of 10 over 58.6 all over ln of 8 over 58.6 minus ln of 10 over 58.6. There we go. So what is that? Um, is that approximately equal to? Let's type that in the calculator. So 0.5 times ln of 10 over 58.6 divided by ln of 8 divided by 58, 58.6 minus ln of 10 over 58.6. And I get 3.96. So that would tell us, oh, this 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 body has been here about four hours. Pretty, pretty close to exactly four hours. Assuming I didn't make a mistake typing this in the calculator, which of course is possible. Anyway, so that's sort of a, a bit of a twist on a more standard problem. This one here is the more standard problem. And this one's a bit of an adjustment on that. Um, you know, if you're not given K, you need to figure it out. You have to do a little bit of extra work.